Seven pounds on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. A very good afternoon and welcome to The Briefing PM, an hour of the latest political news debate and analysis here on GB News. I'm Darren McCaffrey and here's what's coming up over the next hour. Rishi Sunak's fall from grace after revelations about his wife's tax arrangements, hot on the heels of a poorly received spring statement. Can the Chancellor revive his ministerial, prime ministerial ambitions? We'll be in France as well as the far right's Marine Le Pen will take on the centrist Emmanuel Macron in the final round of the presidential elections. Is the real divide in France not left and right, but the establishment versus the populists? We'll be looking ahead to that crucial moment. And Caressa de Dick has finally left the Metropolitan Police forced out by the Mayor of London. We'll look back on her legacy as Britain's most senior police officer. As always, we want to hear from you as well. Do get in touch. You know what to do now. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk or you can tweet me at gbnews. Keen to hear what you've got to say on those stories and much more. That's all between 12 and 1. But first, at the top of the hour, here's Rosie Wright with the news. Good afternoon, it's just one minute past 12. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. The Austrian Chancellor is going to push for a ceasefire in Ukraine when he meets the Russian president in Moscow later. It's going to be the first time an EU leader has had a face-to-face -face meeting with Vladimir Putin since the war began. Now, Ukraine is bracing for a new attack in the east, with President Zelensky warning that Russia's readying tens of thousands of troops for the next offensive. New videos also emerged showing the extent of the damage at the National Theatre in Mariupol, which was destroyed during an airstrike, killing at least 300 people. Jamil Jaffa, who served in the White House as an associate counsel to the president, warned there'll be many more casualties. The situation we're seeing on the ground is terrible. Over 10 million people displaced, 6.5 million within Ukraine itself, thousands of civilians dead, continuously being targeted by the Russians hospitals, schools and the like being targeted by the Russians. Uh, the situation is getting worse by the minute and Putin has very little incentive to negotiate while he is focused on the eastern part now. The fact of the matter is that he will try to starve the Ukrainians out. The Chancellor has referred himself to the Prime Minister's independent advisor on ministers' interests. Well, it's after it emerged that Rishi Sunak held a US green card while in office and that his wife holds non-domicile status. Well, the Chancellor says he followed the rules and he hopes the review will provide further clarity. The Shadow Justice Secretary Steve Reid told us the Chancellor's failure to declare his wife's non-dom status is just one of many concerns. The Finance Act that's just gone through Parliament, there are changes to the rules that benefit wealthy non-doms. Now, under the Ministerial Code, ministers are supposed to declare that kind of thing so that they can recuse themselves and not take part in decisions that will affect their own household income. There are a whole list of concerns like that about Rishi Sunak's behaviour, and we need to get to the bottom of it. From today, millions of people in the UK will see a rise in their state pensions, but it won't be enough to match the growing cost of living. Pensions and universal credit benefits have increased by 3.1%, but the Office for Budget Responsibility says inflation could hit a 40-year high of 8.7% later this year. Well, pensions analyst Helen Morrissey told GB News the financial boost is not enough. With inflation already at 6.2% and look, looking to go higher over the next few months, it's a drop in the ocean when they're battling against soaring bills and food costs. Heating costs are on the rise as well, and they're going to really struggle to make ends meet, particularly those people who are very, very dependent on the state pension. Britain's economy almost stalled in February, with growth slowing more than was expected. The Office for National Statistics says gross domestic product increased just 0.1 per cent. That's compared to a rise of 0.8 per cent in January. Well, the slowdown comes as the cost of living crisis starts to take hold. 
Lorry drivers staging a protest in Dublin are being fined for blocking main roads to the port. Demonstrating against fuel prices, the drivers shut off a toll bridge and threatened to bring a complete lockdown to the city. They're also demanding the resignation of the Transport Minister, Eamon Ryan. In the UK, a record 21.5 million car journeys are expected over the Easter weekend. The RAC is warning drivers that the getaway between Good Friday and Easter Monday will be the busiest on the roads in at least eight years. Thousands of passengers will also be travelling by rail and air. The latest figures show Heathrow recorded its busiest month since the pandemic started, with more than four million passengers passing through the airport last month. Now, in France, Emmanuel Macron will face Marine Le Pen in the second round of the French presidential election. The incumbent president and his far-right rival came out on top in Sunday's first round vote. That sets up a repeat of their 2017 runoff. A number of polls are predicting that Macron will win, but with a tight margin. All of the major candidates in the election, bar one, have called now for tactical voting against Le Pen. The Queen has revealed she was left very tired and exhausted during her bout of coronavirus in February. The monarch made a video call to the Royal London Hospital this week and she sympathised with a former Covid patient who'd lost both his brother and his father to the infection. The Queen tested positive in February and despite suffering what Buckingham Palace called mild, cold-like symptoms, she was determined to carry out what duty she could. I'm glad that you're getting better and you... And it, it does leave one very tired and exhausted, doesn't it, this horrible yeah. pan mm. pandemic? This is GB News. You're up to date and I'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head to Darren for this lunchtime briefing. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Rosie. Uh, we're on TV, online and on your radio on this Monday afternoon. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your company. Let's begin uh, with the Chancellor this afternoon, because Rishi Sunak has referred himself to the independent advisers on ministers' interest. In a letter to Lord Guite, he intends to clarify his wife's non-dom status and why he had a US green card up until the back end of last year. The latest scandal revelations about the Chancellor saw him moving his family out of number 10 over the weekend. And his response to the questions about his wife's tax affairs again appears to have left people asking whether his chances of succeeding Boris Johnson are all but over. Well, joining me to discuss all of this is our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, who is in the studio with me. Tom, good afternoon uh, to you. Complicated story, all of this. Uh, the, the Labour Party essentially saying to, there's a kind of uh, a very simple way to look at it, which is that you've got a chancellor who's in charge of people's taxes uh, and a wife who potentially is not paying the taxes that she should be, if, even if she's not breaking the law, that morally she should be paying in the UK. That's absolutely it. It's the distinction between what's legally needed to be done versus what morally should perhaps be done. And uh, clearly the uh, chancellor has given a bit of a concession away in this area towards the back end of last week week, uh, saying that his wife will give up non-DOM status and will, after all, start paying British tax on foreign income. Now, before she made that move, it did seem like they might well hold out on this issue. It is arguable that someone who has earnings overseas should pay taxes on those earnings where those earnings are earned, rather than everything being paid in this country, indeed perhaps double taxation being paid both in India and in the United Kingdom. That's an argument that could be made, and it's one that many governments have made for decades, even centuries. Non-DOM status has been around since the 1700s. And whether it's been a, a Tory, a Peelite, a Pittite, a Whig, a, a, a Conservative or indeed a Labour government. Go through all, yeah. We could go through every single government for the last yeah. uh, however many uh, hundred years and no one's got rid of this status because it does provide a certain benefit to the country. It's better having these international people living here than not. But the Chancellor but not decided the that was too, hard, too yeah. hard to argue. Yeah. And so you turned on that particular decision. His wife will now be paying tax going forward on all income in the UK, but also back paying for the last year as well. Uh, but clearly this story is dragging on because of this letter to Lord Guy, uh, because of this demand for an investigation. And then we've got this other kind of aspect to it, which is the US green card mm. that the Chancellor himself had. Now, you only get a green card in the United States if you've worked there, but then additionally applied, essentially, 
for domicile status, that is, i.e., that is your primary residence. Mm. And yet he still had this green card up until October of last year, even though he'd been Chancellor for 18 months. Yes, it is right to say, however, Rishi Sunak was living in America before he became an, ME, uh, uh, an MP here in 2015. Um, it, it, it seems to be the case that sort of he had this green card for living in the United States and just never really gave it up. It just sort of rolled over and continued. It has to be said that this was brought up at a press uh, briefing in the famous White House uh, West Wing press briefing room um, with Jen Psaki, the spokesperson for uh, uh, Joe Biden, who seemed to dismiss it as an issue, even though technically the words of green card say you, your primary residence needs to be the United States. It didn't seem like the White House had that much of a concern with it, but it does add up to this overall picture of is Rishi as slick a politician as everyone had been thinking for the last two years? Yeah, or was he a lucky guy in that yeah. he was able to dish out a lot of money to people that made him incredibly popular? And now that he's trying to claw some of that money back to pay for all of that spending, suddenly all these other scandals start to bubble up because he's no longer sort of the politician that no one can touch. And, and, and isn't that the interesting aspect of this, is that even amongst some of his supporters, or certainly Conservative MPs, uh, a feeling that he should have seen some of these things coming, uh, and that actually uh, that, that sense of kind of a political astuteness is, is being called into question. Well, that's quite right. Uh, Rishi Sunak's only been in Parliament since 2015, only joined the Cabinet relatively recently, and then was shot into being Chancellor at the very start of his Cabinet career. This is someone who's relatively new to politics. Still, I mean, all the very accomplished in the private sector before politics, but uh, in terms of his role in Parliament, still relatively fresh faced, and so bumping into these scandals at the top of his game is uh, is a is a worry. And some people are asking the question: uh, Was it the best move to demand this investigation now? Because ultimately, if Rishi Sunak had not asked for this all to be independently and investigated and, and probably cleared as he will be, would we be having this conversation today? This has generated. A whole new, fresh round of newspaper headlines potentially counterproductive. Well, though, in, in saying that, some people are suggesting that, or well, I think some of the supporters, that he had been maybe too honest uh, when he sat down at the start of his ministerial career uh, with all the details he's provided, because that has allowed at least someone within government to leak this information. Uh, and big questions about who that is, whether it's Boris Johnson's team trying to do down a possible challenger, or, or simply just the opposition with the disgruntled uh, civil servant. But there is now going to be a leak inquiry, isn't there? There is indeed. Now, we hear a lot about leak inquiries in number 10 across the never they never find the mould. They very rarely find the mould. Do, um, do you remember the tweet that was sent about Dominic Cummings from the official uh, Cabinet Office Twitter account saying, who would work with these, and I'm not going to use the exact profanity that was uh, tweeted out, but, I mean, yes, there are lots of leaks a lot of the time. Even the photograph that was taken of Boris Johnson sitting in the garden with some of his advisers in what he claims was a work event in what other people suggest might have been a party. Uh, we never got to the bottom of who took that photograph and how that was leaked either. Many of these leak inquiries established, uh, few of them actually turn out the truth. OK, Tom, as always, thank you very much indeed. Tom Holbert, our political correspondent in uh, the studio. OK, let's move on now because the trial of, or the jury in the trial of Ali Harbi Ali, who is accused of murdering the Conservative MP Sir David Amos in Essex last year, has been hearing the closing arguments uh, this morning in that case. Sir David was stabbed to death while holding a constituency surgery, prompting condemnation of the killing from across the political spectrum, as well as a renewed focus, unsurprisingly, on the issue of MPs' safety. Well, joining us now outside the Old Bailey is our Home Affairs and Security Editor, uh, Mark White. Uh, Mark, very good afternoon uh, to you. Uh, the summing up in this case has been taking place this morning. Yes, things moving much more quickly than we had initially thought. It was believed that this could roll over into tomorrow before the jury is sent out. But already this morning, uh, we've had a very quick prosecution closing argument and then the defence closing statement. Uh, now we are uh, at uh, fairly uh, well into, in fact, the judge's summing up as he sets out the legal requirements for the jury that they have to consider, of course, the evidence before them and uh, nothing else, uh, pointing out that uh, Ali Harbi Ali has given evidence in this trial, that in that trial he admitted during his evidence that he killed Sir David Amos. He said that the reason he 
uh, killed Sir David Amos, stabbed him to death on the 15th of October uh, inside that Baptist church during a regular constituency surgery that Sir David Amos was carrying out was, according to the defendant, to save the lives of other Muslims. He had done uh, this, this act, he says, uh, because of Sir David's voting record, particularly on issues around Syria and the bombing of Aleppo. He is uh, an avowed supporter of Islamic State. He said in his evidence that he had been planning to go out and join up with Islamic State but had decided uh, against that and instead wanted to uh, carry out an act here in this country. According to the prosecution, this was years uh, in its uh, uh, sort of plotting its digest um, period uh, as far as the uh, plot is concerned that he had looked at uh, a number of potential victims not just Sir David Amos that he considered the cabinet minister Michael Gove also the deputy prime minister Dominic Raab as well as the leader of the Labour Party Sir Keir Stammer before finally settling on Sir David Amos an easy target, a man always accessible to his constituents, who, as I say, was carrying out that regular constituency surgery, something that MPs the length and breadth of the country do on a regular basis. Uh, he had, uh, the defendant, tricked his way into that constituency surgery by saying that he was moving to the area. And shortly after a face-to-face -face meeting with Sir David Amos, he produced the knife and then stabbed him more than 20 times. So, as I see the judge making some headway now in his summing up. We're expecting that the jury could be sent out uh, as early as lunchtime. And just very finally, uh, Mark, and we touched upon it there, didn't we, about the concern around safety of other MPs? And we say that because also what uh, we heard in court uh, was uh, that the defendant had uh, essentially tracked um, and followed and considered attacking other members of parliament. Yes, obviously there was a great deal of concern about the safety of politicians, not just MPs, but politicians in general following the death of Sir David Amos, because of course that followed uh, previous uh, deaths, the murder of Joe Cox and uh, attacks on other politicians in recent years uh, and there was a review that was carried out in the wake of the death of Sir David Amos with a view to looking at what advice and practical help could be offered to politicians to ensure that they are as safe as they can be remembering of course that as a politician, a Westminster politician or a more localised politician, they are all accountable to their electorate. It's something they take very seriously indeed and politicians will always try to make themselves as accessible as possible in an open and free democracy. But in doing that, it has its inherent risks because you are coming face to face with members of the public and you can't necessarily legislate for what that member of the public might do at any given time. OK, uh, Mark, as always, uh, appreciate that. Mark White there joining us from the Obelian. and he, of course, will bring us uh, that verdict in that trial as soon as it comes in, as he says, the jury due to be sent out around lunchtime to consider the verdict. OK, it is 18 minutes past 12 o'clock. You're watching GB News. Coming up in just a couple of minutes, we're going to be live in Paris as the big battle commence between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. Could the far right win out in the French presidential election? We'll be debating that in just a couple of minutes. But first... Summer, potentially. Early summer. The weather's getting warmer. And here it is. Hi there, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Cloud for many of us through the rest of the day. Some showery rain as well, particularly towards the west and later the north. And it will be breezy, that breeze coming in around an area of low pressure, which is sitting to the west. Now, this is the feature that is sending some areas of cloud and outbreaks of showers or rain. These showers have had some thunder associated with them as uh, they push in from the west. But I think mostly it's just going to be some heavy bursts of rain that will move into parts of Wales, Northern Ireland, and then eventually parts of central England later. Another area of rain moving through Scotland. A lot of cloud on the map, but some brighter spells and it'll be a gusty breeze, but that breeze is coming from a mild direction. So 18 Celsius possible in the southeast 
uh, mid-teens generally elsewhere. Still quite cold for Lerwick. And then through the night, showers or outbreaks of rain move through northern England into Northern Ireland, Scotland as well. Some persistent wet weather for eastern parts of Scotland with a keen breeze here. And then further showers follow from the south. Again, a few rumbles of thunder possible towards the southwest and Wales. But it's a mild night, 6 Celsius in Glasgow, 10 Celsius for southern England and south Wales. Heavy rain or showers for many as we start off Tuesday. They push north, an area of rain clearing from the Northern Isles and then further rain arriving into Northern England, Northern Ireland and Scotland through the day. That wrapped round into parts of South East England, so some wet weather to come here. Brighter skies for Wales, Western England as well and temperatures right reaching the high teens. But even here there'll be a few scattered showers around and some heavy downpours in places. Into Tuesday evening, showers and rain tend to migrate northeastwards. Some clear spells at times, but for many it's another mild night. And actually, the weather is warming up, although we'll keep a lot of cloud in the sky during Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Temperatures will reach the high teens or even low 20s. I'm Liam Halligan. Join me every weekday at 1pm for On The Money, your daily dose of economics, business and consumer news. I got 25 years experience covering economics and finance. We hold grown up discussions with a host of experts who really know their stuff. We can't buy gas and store it. That was a mistake, wasn't it? I think it was a mistake. Even you, Liam, don't have a crystal ball. Inflation's a real threat. Every weekday at 1, you're On The Money. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Uh, very welcome back to GB News. Uh, do get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.uk, or indeed tweet us. We'll get some of your views later, later on in the programme, particularly about uh, Rishi Sunak. What do you think? Is it a big story? Do you agree with the Labour Party? Um, or indeed, uh, do you think we should stay out of the Chancellor's wife's affairs? Do get in touch. gbviews at gbnews.uk. Join the discussion. Let's move to France now, though, because people went to the polls yesterday for the first round of the presidential elections there. And Emmanuel Macron won with a 27.6% share of the vote, followed by the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen on 23.4%. According to experts, this vote confirms a shift in the political narrative of France. It is no longer a left and right division, but one that seems to be divided between pro-EU and a nationalist one, one that's very much focused on urban areas versus rural areas. We'll discuss all of this 
from Paris is Anne Elizabeth Moet, a French journalist who uh, is going to make sense of what happened last night. Um, let's just start, Elizabeth, with the results. Emmanuel Macron did better uh, than I think people thought yesterday, uh, but then so did Marine Le Pen, both getting uh, higher percentages than they did back in 2017. Yes, and it's partly got to do with the fact that this time uh, the the the, cha the choice looked so stark that instead of voting for small candidates whom they wanted to vote uh, uh, for and sort of have to choose to for the least worst uh, in two weeks' time, many voters decided immediately that they had to do what the French called voter utile, the useful vote, and um, they each picked uh, one essentially to bar the way of the other. Uh, so Marine Le Pen uh, uh, gained votes from uh, the hard right, uh, Eric Zemmour, and the Republican right, Valérie Pécresse, and Emmanuel Macron won votes from almost uh, everyone except um, uh, those hard left or Corbyn-like voters in the French uh, now almost defunct Socialist Party who went to the third man that people don't talk about, but who's only half a million votes from Marine Le Pen and who's Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who is, as I said, the French equivalent of Jeremy Corbyn heading his own party. Indeed. But you touched upon it there, didn't you? The sense that the two main political parties battered, or traditional political parties, uh, the Conservatives and the Socialists, the Republicans and the Socialists, battered in 2017, essentially decimated uh, yesterday, I think collectively between them, uh, not getting 7% of the vote, both of them losing their ability to claim back election expenses uh, because they got so few uh, votes. Is this a sign of where French politics now is, that it's not uh, necessarily between the left and the right, between extremes and the centre ground, between urban and rural areas, between uh, nationalism and Emmanuel Macron's sense of being very pro-European? Uh, there's a great deal of that. It's entirely that one was wrought by Emmanuel Macron. It was not wrought by Marine Le Pen so much. I would also be careful about rural areas. It's more, uh, it's really the equivalent of, of, of Brexit voters. I mean, it's the Red Wall. It's, it's places, small towns, places that don't have many public services, places that if the one company that's in town closes, then you have no jobs. You can't sell your home because it's not worth anything anymore. It's this sort of thing. And then you've got voters voters who vote for cultural issues. So it's a complicated mishmash. But what's certain is that Emmanuel Macron, when he came last time, seemingly out of nowhere, what was not so much appreciated at the time was that uh, the, the French voters already had this sort of feeling that they wanted to get uh, rid of the incumbents because they still, they already felt that they were not being listened to. But here was this man who looked like a safe choice. He was not an extremist. And this is why I don't think France is that extremist. He looked like the other but they all of them hated him because he was 25 years younger and he said things that they weren't saying and therefore he said I'm going to join together the forces of the left and the forces of the right and they voted for him and it, some of it was a kind of populist reaction but now they've seen that of course he's like his predecessor because he comes from the same mold uh, and um, they um, uh, you, you've got a hard core of voters who voted yesterday, but um, uh, the rest feel that he still has not listened to them and their choice was the wrong one. Um, it's, it's, it's a, you know, France is a complicated country. It makes it, I hope, interesting, but uh, that's the way it is. The, 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 some, of the, some of the hard right voters will not vote for Marine Le Pen. Some of the Zemmour's voters will not vote for Marine Le Pen. Some of the socialist voters will not vote for Emmanuel Macron, it's it's a bit in the air. Uh, let's talk about Le, Le Pen for a second, if we can. Lots of reasons, as you say, not least of all the cost of living crisis, uh, which is clearly a, a global affair, it must be said, not just um, a kind of British focus affair that we like to reflect in this country. Uh, but also, uh, there is a sense with Le Pen, and it's something that she's played on time and time again, um, uh, particularly in regard to, to Islam, in which her argument is uh, that she wants to get back to almost a mono-ethnic uh, France. Now, that's not going to happen, but she wants to uh, deal with issues around the side, for example, uh, banning... Uh, or fining, I think, women who wear headscarves in, in public, for example. I heard one of her MPs make that argument on the radio this morning. Stuff that, frankly, would be entirely unacceptable, I think, 
in this country that a mainstream politician could not only make those comments and propel those arguments, but end up finishing second in the election? I don't think this is quite what she says. I'm not saying that her followers do not say that. I don't think that's quite what she says. Uh, and uh, it's entirely got to do with a very different way of the way the France is structured and structured um, uh, immigration. Uh, over centuries, France has been uh, a, an immigration country. One out of th three French people could um, uh, date, you know, find uh, uh, foreign ancestors uh, in the mid 20th century, that is before immigration from the former colonies came into France. So really, it's not the same thing. The point is that you 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 come from a certain nationality. You're a Pole. You're an Italian. You're a Portuguese, and now you're an Algerian. You're a Moroccan, and you become French. And you do not forget where you come from, but you are French. And the the attitudes to 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 uh, the system is that you you assimilate yourself like the old American melting pot that has completely disappeared as well. It was not as racist as people made it out to be. Some people made it out to be because they they felt. Uh, 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 hurt by it, but some other people made it up, up to be racist because it helped their own their own political might, if you like. Uh, she, I'm not. She herself, I don't think, is a racist. Uh, she has racists around her. She certainly has a racist father, and she has racist followers, but they're not a majority. And whenever at rallies, she or Eric Zemmour were brought in to speak. Uh, um, uh, some of the people that they're now going to field in the legislative elections in a month's time, who were uh, a BAME, uh, of various minorities, people applauded them twice because they said, we love you because you want to be French. So it's extremely difficult to make this understood in Britain because Britain works in a different way. And that's what makes countries interesting, is that they're different. But that's that's not exactly what's meant. Okay. Um, no, no that, it's good to clarify that. And, and as you say, places are different and got different perceptions. Just, just very quickly, and in the space of 30 seconds, if you can, in the end, is Macron simply going to win this because there will be enough voters who will switch to him to keep Le Pen out like, like they did last time? My personal bet is yes, because at the end of the day, they will look at Marine Le Pen, and apart from everything that I've already described to you, I mean, they will worry that whatever she promises, they're not going to get it. There's also the fact that at the end of the day, even though she's changed it, she's changed herself personally in a very interesting way, she looks softer, uh, her party is like a family concern. I mean, she's got consiglieri around her rather than politicians, and whenever she had somebody in her party that looked like they were brighter than her, she finds them and I, I don't think people want that kind of person in power. Okay, well, fascinating stuff. We're going to find out in less than two weeks' time. Uh, Anna Elizabeth, thank you so much indeed for joining us there from uh, Paris. We'll get you on in and around uh, the result. That's Anna Elizabeth Moet Motet, sorry, joining us there from uh, Paris. Um, okay, you're watching GB News. Uh, we've got lots more coming up, but first, let's bring you the very latest news just after half past the hour. Good afternoon, it's 12.32. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date. The Austrian Chancellor is going to push for a ceasefire in Ukraine when he meets the Russian president in Moscow later. It'll be the first time an EU leader has had a face-to-face -face meeting with Vladimir Putin since the war began. Ukraine is bracing for a new attack in the east, with President Zelensky warning Russia is readying tens of thousands of troops for the next offensive. New videos also emerged showing the extent of damage at the National Theatre in Mariupol, which was destroyed during an airstrike, killing at least 300 people. The Prime Minister's spokeswoman says Boris Johnson has agreed to the Chancellor's request of an independent review of his finances. Well, it's after it emerged that Rishi Sunak held a US green card while in office and that his wife holds non-domicile status. He says he followed the rules and hopes the review will provide further clarity. Millions of people in the UK are going to see a rise in their state pensions from today, but it won't be enough to match the growing cost of living. Pensions and universal credit benefits have increased by 3.1%, but the Office for Budget Responsibility says inflation could hit a 40-year high of 8.7% later this year. A record number of car journeys is expected this weekend, with the RAC anticipating 21.5 million trips over the Easter break. Thousands of passengers will also be travelling by rail and air, and the latest figures show that Heathrow Airport recorded its busiest month since the pandemic started, with more than 4 million passengers passing through the airport last month. 
The Queen has revealed she was left very tired and exhausted during her bout of coronavirus in February. The monarch made a video call to Royal London Hospital this week, sympathising with a former COVID patient who lost his brother and father to the illness. You're up to date on GB News on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. Shortly, we'll be back to Darren for this afternoon's briefing. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. A very welcome back to GB News. It is going to 23 minutes to 1 o'clock. We are on TV, online and on uh, your radio. Lots of you have been getting in touch. GB Views at GBNews.uk this afternoon. Very, people very animated uh, by Rishi Sunak, uh, the Chancellor, and these questions about his wife and tax and the green card in the United uh, States. Michael says if uh, the Chancellor Sunak is trying to claw back money given in the lockdowns, then why has the government decided not to pursue those businesses who made fraudulent claims? Most finance was wasted. Uh, when it shouldn't have been. Peter says that the media, presenters and journalists are on a witch hunt against the Chancellor who's capable of doing the job. If left to do it, he would make a great Prime Minister. Uh, Jerain says that I'm a Conservative member and I've voted Conservative all my life. I'm not concerned about Rishi Sunak's wealth, but I am angry that as a Chancellor he foolishly thought it would be acceptable for his wife to avoid paying taxes in the UK. Um, of course, what she's doing is entirely legal. Uh, she chose to support India uh, with her taxes. Uh, and clearly, uh, if he wants to be Prime Minister, the question is, does he have a commitment to the UK? And Jeff says the Sunaks uh, will have shared resources. Therefore, if Mrs Sunak fails to pay her taxes, Mr Sunak benefits. If the Chancellor is so naive to not understand this, then clearly he shouldn't be an MP, let alone uh, Chancellor. So that's what you think, gbviews at gbnews.uk, though, as we keep saying, uh, she's not done anything illegal. It's a question about whether um, she should, uh, in some ways, uh, be taking a different path, given the Chancellor's position. Do get in touch, uh, and we'll get to some of your other views on other issues a little later on on the programme as well. But let's move on, because yesterday was the last day of Caressa de Tick as the Metropolitan Police uh, Commissioner. She was the first openly gay commissioner of the Met Police, but she resigned after the mayor, Sadiq Khan, said that he had lost confidence in her. Now, that loss of confidence followed a whole series of scandals that, it must be said, affected public belief and confidence in the Metropolitan Police, such as the mishandling of the murder of Sarah Everard and, indeed, the vigil that followed uh, later. Two police officers, of course, jailed for taking pictures of the body of murdered sisters. And there was accusations of misogyny, racism, discrimination and sexual harassment at a police unit based in central London at Charing Cross. 
So what do we make of Caressa the next time? She was in the Met for a very long period of time. And what do the police need to do next to regain that public trust? Well, joining me to discuss all of this is a former police officer, Chris Hobbs, who joins us in the studio. Um, I, I went through there and out of fairness, some of the criticisms and some of the problems and the scandals that have beset uh, her tenure as police commissioner. But she was in the Met for decades. And she did some good stuff as well. She did. She's very, very popular, as can be gauged. She's regarded as someone who actually supports and has the back of her officers, which, it, which is important. She did some outstanding work in Operation Trident, where she was commander. And I was not technically under her command, but, um, but I did answer to her. And this was a period of time when the black community and the police had this Rapprochement. She worked really hard to get the black community to trust her officers. And Operation Trident, which dealt with black on black shootings primarily and organised crime, was very successful. And even some of the activists, who quite frankly have nothing but contempt for the police, praised the work of Operation Trident during this period. And some of that was down to Cressida Dick. But basically, she was very popular because she cared about her officers. And now she's gone, there's some trepidation about her. Uh, who makes it? In saying that, I mean, and, and some of this is, it must be said, due to her and some of the decisions she made, but also some of it was out of her control. But the Met has been involved in what it seems is kind of scandal after scandal, particularly in the last year or so. I think that's right, but I think and we probably haven't got time to actually unpick all the incidents that you've just referred to. The Sarah Everard vigil, Wayne Cousins, who, how did he get into the Met? Well, he transferred from two different forces, from one force to another, then to the Met. Um, much of the vetting clearly, it was felt, wasn't applicable to Mr Cousins. Uh, that was shocking, absolutely abysmal. The vigil, again, lots of, uh, lots of accounts of that heavy-handed policing, but from people who were there objectively looking at it, they said, sorry. Well, and there was an investigation that exonerated the police in that matter. That's right, yes, by the police inspectorate. Uh, I know people who were there, I wasn't there myself, but I know people who were there who, who said basically the police facilitated it for six hours. And when they came to disperse it, they were very polite, asked people nicely, look, please go home. And it, it all went wrong from there. But nine arrests, seven of those were de-arrested, two ended up in police custody suites, no one ended up in the accident and the emergency, no fleets of ambulances to take protesters away. It was... Um, it was but, unfortunate. But, but, there is a, but she'd obviously lost the confidence of Sadiq Khan. Uh, I mean, that, in the end, is what saw her leave. But there was a sense, even if, you know, and you talked about the Sarah Everard case, Everard case there, that, the, you know, the, 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 the rules were stuck by and whatever, but, but that she had lost public confidence. There was a sense that the public, for various reasons, um, had essentially lost confidence in her leadership of the Met. Is that fair? I think one of the criticisms I had of Cressida Dick, and, and I've got great respect for her, and, and personally I can vouch for the way she looks after her officers, but the, the fact the Met never portray what they do well, their comms, as we call it, their public relations, is woeful. Um, last night, for example, there was an incident in Newham, mental health. Now, the number of calls police get to mental health cases, 40,000 a year for the Met. They deal with most of them, just about all of them extremely well. Last night, officer had his arms slashed. It was a siege. The fire brigade turned up and had to evacuate people from the building by ladders. Major event. Uh, the guy ends up trying to slit his own throat. The police have got hold of him. He's in hospital. He's going, to be, he's going to be fine, hopefully, at least from the physical injury. But that was one incident. You would like to think that, that at some stage, maybe if the guy's charged after the court case, that will be put together by the Met, body-worn camera footage, etc., etc. This is what our officers do day after yeah, the, day. The heroic, of, uh, the kind of, as you say, the day-to-day -day heroic efforts that, that the police make is not necessarily uh, reflected. It's always the bad news that gets, makes the headlines. One absolutely of the good spot on. Just finally, I mean, who do we think is going to take over? And if so, what do they need to do, do you reckon? It, I do worry about some of the names uh, that are in the frame to take over. First of all, they need to have the loyalty of the officers. They need to be able to boost the morale of the officers. They need to be able to call officers out when they behave badly, but to defend officers when things go well. Uh, some of the names, as I say, I'm not terribly keen on. There is one name, dare I mention it, who most police officers would love to see as the Met, and that is the current Chief Constable of Northamptonshire, Nick Adderley. If there's problems, he deals with them. 
if there's wrongdoing by his officers, he deals with it, but he will defend his officers. He's very outspoken and he does an outstanding job in Northamptonshire. Most police officers, I think, who've been following you know, the who's who of candidates would love to see him, but I suspect because he does speak his mind, uh, the he mayor, Pretty Patel, yeah. I, I doubt it, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Well, we'll wait and see. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Chris Hobbs there uh, for joining us in the studio. OK, let's move on to Ukraine now, because the Prime Minister made a secret visit, which then became very public, to meet President Volodymyr Zelensky in Kyiv at the weekend. Reports confirmed that the Prime Minister travelled uh, on a train from Poland. He promised a new package of financial and military aid uh, for the embattled country. Well, delighted to say I'm joined now by Paul Beaver. He's a defence analyst and joined us down the line. Uh, Paul, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, just first of all, I mean, it's, it's pretty... We saw Ursula von der Leyen, it should be said, the EU, EU Commission president in Ukraine on Friday. It is, it's pretty unusual, isn't it, for world leaders uh, to go into war zones when there's essentially still an act of war going on. I, I, th I find it amazing, and I'm heartened by the fact that European leaders, whether the European Union, the Joint Expeditionary Force, NATO, um, our own prime minister, are all going to Ukraine to show solidarity. And they're putting themselves at risk by walking around Kyiv, for example. Um, and they're getting face-to-face -face time with President Zelensky. I think this is all very, very positive. I'd like to see more um, of this happen. Uh, but of course, it's all very well for people to go there. What you really need now is for uh, the promises that have been made to be um, uh, uh, followed up and the equipment to be delivered as soon as possible. Ukraine is able to hold the Russians at the moment in, in some fronts. It needs to get onto the offensive and therefore um, we need to be able to support it because I don't think anyone uh, would argue the fact that Ukraine has been invaded. And therefore, um, demands are uh, our support. Uh, and, and as you talked about there, going on the offensive, it's very much that this war, the theatre of the war, if you like, it seems to be concentrated or will be in the east, in the Donbass region, uh, with uh, the United States, the EU and Britain suggesting uh, that Russia is looking uh, to, uh, again, go on the offensive in a major way in that part of Ukraine. Yes, I can see the Russian military going um, onto the offensive in the Donbass. What they've done is that uh, they've withdrawn their forces from around Kyiv um, and they're, they're concentrating in that corridor between the annexed um, area of, of uh, Crimea and the Donbass, um, trying to drive a corridor there. The other thing I think they're going to try and do is move westerly towards Odessa, because what they'd then like to do is block Ukraine off from the sea, cutting off uh, any chance of aid from, from the water. Uh, the Russians have obviously got to the stage now where they believe that the the conflict um, has moved into an attrition phase from a, an initial invasion. Uh, they will do what they did in Aleppo and they did in Grozny and um, uh, Chechnya. They will, um, they will punish the civilians, they will destroy the infrastructure, uh, they'll try and terrorise before they move in. Uh, this war isn't going to stop soon, but we can help it get to the negotiating table which is the only place that is going to stop, um, by supplying equipment quickly and getting the Ukrainians trained to use it. In saying that, I mean, I, and I get the, the, this idea that they kind of want a moon crescent, if you like, from, from Crimea um, along the Russian border up to the, the top near uh, Kharkiv, as far as I understand it. But at the same time, that, that kind of war of attrition means they're going to be bogged down for potentially a very long period of time, given how well the Ukrainians have fought and, and the weapon supply that they're getting from the West. Also, they potentially would have to govern an area that's been decimated by themselves. And also, do they have, and, you know, reading articles over the weekend, do they have the kind of sufficiently good troops to do that, because some of the best Ukrainian fighters are dug in in the Donbass region, and they've lost some good fighters in that initial invasion, the Russians. Well, certainly uh, uh, Ukraine has had casualties, and they've been quite significant casualties. However, they have been training for this since 2014. They weren't going to be caught napping as they were uh, with the annexation of, uh, of uh, Crimea. Uh, they've been trained by NATO. They've been trained by friendly forces. 
Um, the, the British Army's had a training team in Ukraine for some time. That's obviously withdrawn with the invasion. However, um, they were trained well. There, is about, there are about 900,000 um, Defence Force uh, people, um, of the bulk of which are reservists, the bulk of which have had very little training. But at the end of the day, this is about the resolve of a whole nation to defend its territory against an aggressor. That gives you a huge amount of, the spirit of resistance is huge. It gives you a huge amount of, of, uh, of willpower, if you like, um, to move ahead and to, um, and to do things which are extraordinary. And we've seen that already. I'm very impressed with what I've seen and read about uh, the Ukrainian forces. However, it's, there's only so much. There's only so many shells and rockets and, and bombs that they've got. They've only so many helicopters and aircraft. They need all of these things. At the end of the day, what they have to do is to hold the Russians in the Donbass, which I'm not sure that actually Ukraine wants, okay. back, to be honest. And then well, and they go to the negotiating table. OK, well, we're going to have to see how that uh, pans out. Uh, but really appreciate uh, your analysis this afternoon. That's Paul Beaver there, uh, joining us from uh, Basingstoke. Paul, thank you very much indeed for joining us. OK, you're watching uh, GB News. We've got some breaking news uh, coming in, and that is we've got a verdict in the trial of the murder of the MP, uh, Sir David Amos. Let's go live to our defence and security editor, Mark White, who's outside the Old Bailey. Uh, Mark, what is the latest? Dramatic moments from court number one here at the Old Bailey now as the jury has just returned guilty verdicts on Ali Harby Ali, the man accused of murdering Sir David Amos on the 15th of October last year. It took the jury really no more than about 15 minutes to deliberate and to come back with their verdict. Uh, guilty on two counts, count one, preparing acts of terrorism and count to that murder charge that he murdered Sir David Amos during his regular constituency meeting on the 15th of October last year. Now, the defendant had actually admitted killing the MP. He gave evidence last week in which he admitted uh, to stabbing Sir David Amos multiple times and said that he didn't regret that, that he'd done that because of the voting record of Sir David Amos when it came to the war in Syria. And he said he was uh, committing this act uh, to try to prevent other Muslims from being killed by decisions made by the likes of Sir David Amos. But that didn't fly with the jury here. He had denied murder, but they have clearly, after a very, very short period of deliberating, decided that he is guilty of not just that murder charge, but also guilty of preparing acts of terrorism, which means that we are looking at a whole life tariff for this man. He will never see the light of day again. I've been looking back at the case, uh, the murder of a much loved local MP. Yes, we say I will wait. Outside this Baptist church in Leon C, the first police arrived to reports of a horrific stabbing. They say he's got a knife and he's just stabbed someone. Lying critically wounded inside the church, local MP Sir David Amos. At the same time, we've got a taser unit one minute away, so we're going to go in and get the taser just moments earlier, frantic 999 calls for help. Please, please, quick now. The man is wielding a knife. Um, he's yeah. threatening me. He's, Where are he's you? killed. He's, he's killed David Amos at Belfast Methodist Church. With the attacker still inside, the unarmed officers decide they have to push forward. Mate, drop the knife. Drop, drop the knife now! Get it down! Right, search him. With the attackers subdued, medics were finally able to reach the stricken MP. But Sir David died at the scene, having suffered more than 20 stab injuries. As he was booked into custody, terrorist Ali Harbi Ali openly admitted his motivation. Domestic or hate related Terror. Right? Pardon? Terror. Earlier, CCTV captured him leaving his London home, heading for Sir David's regular constituency surgery. In his rucksack, the 12-inch long murder weapon. When I first came in, okay. and, uh, yeah, 
Despite denying murder in court, in police interviews, the 26-year-old was more candid. Mr. Anning, is this a terrorist attack? I mean, I guess, yeah. I killed an MP and I done him. Yeah. OK. Ali showed the first signs of radicalisation in 2014 and was briefly referred to counter-extremism programmes. It's a reflection of the challenge we face in counter-terrorism today. So after 16 years as a counter-terrorism detective, the threat has diversified significantly. And if an individual is going to sit at home on their own conducting research and not tell anyone else about their case, that's part of the challenge that we face. Um, but we do that with the family of those that have been radicalised, with, with the public, to take every attempt to disrupt and detect terrorism where we can. Ali had been planning an attack for at least five years before he finally struck, scoping out a number of potential victims, including Cabinet Minister Michael Gove, even writing down possible methods of attack, like targeting him during his morning jog. Fellow Cabinet Minister Dominic Raab and Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer were also in his sights. South End no should way. be the city of Colorado. In the end, he settled on Sir David Amos, an easy target, always accessible to his constituents. David was a very special person, and that is why there's been such a deep feeling of tragedy after his murder. Uh, this was no ordinary MP, this was someone who was completely dedicated to his job. Uh, and to lose someone like that, I think it's affected us all. It certainly affected me very badly. That feeling of profound loss was felt most keenly in Sir David's constituency, where locals developed a deep respect for a politician who dedicated much of his time to campaigning for South End to gain city status. That mission completed posthumously. As he begins life behind bars, Sir David's killer has never shown any remorse for the murder of a much-loved and deeply respected Member of Parliament. Mark White, GB News. Well, I said that uh, as far as uh, Ali Harbi Ali is concerned, not showing any remorse, he doubled down on that, actually, because last week he gave evidence for 80 minutes in the witness box, cross-examined by the prosecution. He said that he did not regret uh, stabbing Sir David Amos to death, that he had done it, he believed, because he wanted, he said anyway to the court, uh, to try to stop other Muslims from being murdered. It was the voting record of Sir David Amos and others who had voted for the bombing of Syria that he blamed specifically Sir David and those other MPs for and as I say with regard to those other MPs he had in his sights for a while uh, the Conservative MP the Cabinet Minister Michael Gove now he had even gone as far as actually jotting down uh, on his electronic devices possible ways of uh, attacking Michael Gove and they included waiting with members of the press outside Michael Gove's home, uh, perhaps creating some kind of a disturbance outside uh, to lure him out, uh, pushing the door in, even trying to bump into him on one of Michael Gove's regular early morning jogs. Uh, he decided against that though uh, and eventually opted for Sir David Amos, uh, an easy target, a local MP who is always, was always accessible to his constituents and who would have been there and available at that constituency surgery in Leon C on the 15th of October. Ali Harbi Ali had tricked his way into that surgery by calling up Sir David's office uh, to say that he was moving to the area, that he wanted to talk about a number of local issues with his soon-to-be local MP and it was that uh, trickery that got him into that constituency surgery armed with that foot-long knife which he then set about attacking Sir David Amos, stabbing him more than 20 times. He died before the medical services could get him to hospital but Ali, Harbi Ali, just in the last few minutes found guilty of two charges preparing acts of terrorism and the murder of Sir David Amos MP. He now faces the likelihood of a whole life tariff in prison.
And just finally, Mark, because we're coming up to the top of the hour, I haven't got much time, just briefly if you can, watching your incredible report, a reminder of the bravery of the police who arrived initially on scene, and not armed police, merely only with batons. Well, this is right. Essex, like so many forces around the country, it's not London where there are armed police often just seconds, minutes at most away from most locations in central London. When you move to places like Essex, it takes them longer to get there. So the first officers on scene often are the unarmed officers. But because they knew a critically ill person was laying uh, injured inside that church hall, they decided to push forward very bravely. But sadly, because of the extent of Sir David's injuries, it was uh, a lost cause. He died before reaching hospital. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much indeed. Mark White there, Home Affairs and Security Editor outside the Old Bailey, and we'll get more uh, from the Old Bailey throughout the afternoon here on uh, GB News. That's Ali Harvey Ali being found guilty of the murder of David Amos. OK, it's coming up to one o'clock. You're watching GB News. I'll be back at three with the briefing. Liam Halligan here in a couple of minutes uh, with On The Money. But first, at one o'clock, here's the very latest news with Rosie Wright. Good afternoon, it's just gone one o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. As we've just heard, Ali Harby Ali has been found guilty of murdering Sir David Amos. Described as a homegrown terrorist, the 26-year-old repeatedly stabbed the Conservative MP in his Essex constituency last October. It took the jury just 18 minutes to return a unanimous verdict. Ali Harby Ali was also found guilty of preparing acts of terrorism. The Austrian Chancellor is going to push for a ceasefire in Ukraine when he meets the Russian president in Moscow later. It's going to be the first time an EU leader has had a face-to-face -face meeting with Vladimir Putin since the war began. Ukraine is bracing for a new attack in the east with its president, Vladimir Zelensky, warning Russia is readying tens of thousands of troops for the next offensive. New videos also emerged showing the extent of the damage at the National Theatre in Mariupol, which had been destroyed during an airstrike, killing at least 300 people. The Ukrainian president says they need help to prevent Russia from attacking other nations. And there can be no hope that Russia will simply stop on its own. And there can be no hope that reason will prevail and the Russian authorities will simply refuse to continue this war. Russia can only be forced to do so, can only be forced to seek peace, be forced to stop torturing people, be forced to respect the independent life of the neighbouring nations, be forced to leave the territory of Ukraine. The Prime Minister's spokeswoman says Boris Johnson has agreed to the Chancellor's request of an independent review of his finances. Well, it's after it emerged that Rishi Sunak held a US green card while in office and that his wife holds non-domicile status. He says he followed the rules and hopes the review will provide further clarity. The Shadow Justice Secretary Steve Reid told GB News the Chancellor's failure to declare his wife's non-dom status is one of many concerns. The Finance Act that's just gone through Parliament, there are changes to the rules that benefit wealthy non-DOMs. Now, under the Ministerial Code, ministers are supposed to, supposed to declare that kind of thing so that they can recuse themselves and not take part in decisions that will affect their own household income. There are a whole list of concerns like that about Rishi Sunak's behaviour, and we need to get to the bottom of it. Millions of people in the UK will see a rise in their state pension from today, but it won't be enough to match the growing cost of living. Pensions and universal credit benefits have increased by 3.1%. But the Office for Budget Responsibility says inflation could hit a 40-year high of 8.7% later this year. Pensions analyst Helen Morrissey told GB News the financial boost is not enough. With inflation already at 6.2% and look, looking to go higher over the next few months, it's a drop in the ocean when they're battling against soaring bills and food costs. Heating costs are on the rise as well, and they're going to really struggle to make ends meet, particularly those people who are very, very dependent on the state pension. 
Lorry drivers staging a protest in Dublin are being fined for blocking main roads to the port. They're demonstrating against fuel prices and the drivers shut off a toll bridge and threatened to bring a complete lockdown to the city. They're also demanding the resignation of the Transport Minister, Eamon Ryan. In France now, and Emmanuel Macron will face Marine Le Pen in the second round of the presidential election. Both were seen back on the campaign trail in northern France and Paris this morning. The incumbent president and his far-right rival came out on top in Sunday's first-round vote, setting up a repeat of their 2017 runoff. A number of polls are predicting that Macron will win with a tight margin. All the major candidates in the election, bar one, have now called for tactical voting against Le Pen. The Queen has revealed she was left very tired and exhausted during her bout of coronavirus in February. The monarch made a video call to Royal London Hospital this week, sympathising with a former Covid patient who lost his brother and father to the illness. The Queen tested positive in February of this year and despite suffering what Buckingham Palace called mild cold-like symptoms, Her Royal Highness was determined to carry out the duty she could. I'm glad that you're getting better and you... And it, it does leave one very tired and exhausted, doesn't it, this horrible yeah. pan mm. pandemic. You're up to date now on GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's head to Liam for On The Money.